Okay. Hey there, everybody. God, that mic really present in the frame, as as it were. Oh, that double mic. I don't, this tape bothers me. Tape bothers me. Tape is amazing, but it bothers me. I get bothered by a lot. Of, I get bothered by wires. Wires and tape give me the. You know, oh, I mean, not right up front. I'm not some sort of freak. I can. Ah, God damn it. I can handle being in a room. Obviously, I cannot handle being in a room today with tape and wires. I mean, they're in here right now. Lots of, man, this place is a mess, but it's in an inevitable mess. I didn't come out quite right, but you get it. There's an inevitability to tapes and wires that's in the rest. So, for me, it feels like a lot to contend with, and if you don't feel like it's a lot to contend with, God, more power to you. Please, bottle it up, I'll buy it. You know, if you found a way to truly not be bothered by a tape and wires, you know, the constant reconfigurations of the connections of your objects and your electronics into your experience, and by all means, I'll come to your workshops. But I find a lot of people that pretend they're not bothered by tape and wires are pretty fucking bothered. I mean, they might not tell you they're bothered by tape and wires, but I look around and I don't see a lot of people that aren't bothered by something. I mean, just kind of generally bothered. And that's what usually leads me to believe that, well, hey, maybe what you're bothered by is tape and wires and you don't even know it. You're just bothered. And then in your botheredness, you're looking around and naming the source of your bother, whatever is kind of like right in front of you, you know? Like maybe your spouse, or your kids, or your parents, or your teachers, or your students, or your co-workers, or your friends, or the traffic, or those faces on TV, or the politics, or those other people, or those other people, where I'm telling you it's all the people all the time that are bothering me. That kind of seems to be an attitude that happens out there. Sure happens in here, I can tell you that. I get bothered by tape and wires pretty extensively. And yet they are creating an environment of possibility for me that is an absolute astounding fucking miracle and there are no two ways about it. The nuts and bolts of transferring data at such a high frequency, for lack of my own knowledge of what it really is, that we can essentially recreate reality in real time, anywhere, anytime. We are traveling through time and don't even know it, oh my fucking God. In the same way we don't know about the nuts and bolts. Or, I mean, the tapes and the wires. We don't know about the nuts and the bolts. It was an uh, impromptu speech here. <laughs> in case you didn't know that. I don't know if that was in the tagline headline deal, but... The nuts and bolts of recreating reality in real time is a form of time travel. I am not right here for you. I mean, you might think that's flip or glib or yeah, we get it, but that's what I mean. Think how casual we've gotten. I am not here for you. Meaning... As you're watching this, I'm not there where you are, which is here. And you're not here now, which is there when you're watching it. <laughs> this is fucking actually insane. I mean, for most of human history, that experience would have been... We don't even have a name for that kind of magic. We don't even have a mythology. We don't even have gods that can capture that kind of... Wait, what? You're just... You're in two places at once? I am now speaking to you and... While I'm speaking to you, this me now is on a totally parallel track, having coffee down the street, wondering what I'm doing with my time, trying to look for clues and hints from everything that's passing me by. Meanwhile, I've got a thousand strands of me replicated, shooting out into this digital ether with a bunch of here's for other people that aren't really now. Or something along those lines, right, for all of us. That's madness and magic. So it's, it's stressful and it's wondrous, all the time. So I think it's good to try to be aware of your tape and wires and your nuts and bolts. Try to be aware of the stress, of the pace of it, of the oddness of recording my reality so I can have you see my reality and return your reality so I might actually have some sort of sense of reality. Wobble, wobble, wobble. Of course, the stress and anxiety of that leads us to run from it, to get back to nature, to get back to people, to get into the realness. But then we are instantly consumed by the possibility of recreating that realness, of broadcasting that realness, so that people can see how real we are, not just to be impressed by us, but because we desperately want to connect to their realness. Or something like that. And the nuts and bolts, uh, the magic fibers, and the, uh, the mythos of the people that have made this. Please, please, please. We don't need to name names. We don't need to say which culture. It is literally, literally the culmination of all humans, the technology we have. It would have been impossible to get here were any of what happened along the way absent. If there weren't the ancient Egyptians, if there weren't the Mayans, if there weren't the Eskimos, 
there weren't the Romans, if there weren't the Greeks, if there weren't the Chinese and Genghis Khan, if there wasn't Africa, if there wasn't the Congo, if there wasn't Mississippi, if there wasn't Iowa, if there wasn't the lineage of all religions and all ethos, if there weren't ancient texts of all forms, none of this would be here. Everything that is, is the result of everything that was. There is no differentiating in terms of impact. No one got here first, right? There is no place to be first from. Where did the first human come from? And it doesn't matter, it does not matter whether it came from a god or came from nature or came from the universe or came from biology. It came from some other plane, however you conceive of that, some firstness. Some moment when there was not what we would call human consciousness, and then some moment later where there was. Again, how you conceive of it, the history you write to get there, we all somehow are aware of that truth in the same way that we are all aware. At one moment we were not, and then we took a breath and opened our eyes, and we had come into being. And one day we will close our eyes and cease to breathe, and we will leave being. We know this to be true for all of us, and in the same way we know it's true for human consciousness itself. So there's no shame or silliness. No averageness or generalization in having the deepest, most profound gratitude imaginable, both for simply being alive and for quite literally every human who came before. Every man, every woman, every child, every almost born, every torn, every tragic, every joyous human life of every color, of every creed, of every structure, good and bad. We can have the deepest gratitude for them, for they are part of what makes us and what has made this particular time unlike anything else that has ever occurred. There are so many more of us by such an incredible exponential growth rate that there has never been a human species like the one that's here now. And accompanying that growth rate of biological organisms is a network of pathways and connections of wires and tape, nuts and bolts that is giving each and every human a conscious interface with the rest of the humanity unlike anything that has ever been seen before. We are living something new. Whether it is glorious or the end does not detract from the greatness of simply being alive now. And when we can breathe in appreciation for those wires and tapes and nuts and bolts that all humans have brought to us, we might, just might, look just slightly differently out of our own eyes at those humans around us and out of the broadcasts that they send to us. Not so much as an antagonist or an other, but as some sort of sibling in a vast newness in which we find ourselves under the same tent of what the fuck is happening. That like young children, we might enjoy this moment of being together now. Seeing some new dawn, some horizon, like a child sees adulthood, knows that some place awaits onto which we project our wonders and hopes and aspirations and imaginations and best intentions. Oh, when I get there. <laughs> What a world it will be. I will take all I know of childhood and endow it upon all that I think adulthood to be. So too we, as a species now, can look to our future with that aspiration. And like siblings, we might rumble and tussle and elbow and scrape. Always with the bond of I love you for being here with me, for being part of my inception. I can see each and every one of you that way. That is something that comes from the gratitude of tape and wires and nuts and bolts. And the reason that I, I wanted to say something today, I have a few things I'd like to get to. That was just like the long, sort of distracted monologue intro. Whew, I am high as a kite. And I gotta tell you, I, I find weed is a real up and down kind of deal. It's been very detrimental at points in my life, I believe. Hey, maybe I'm totally wrong, but I sure seem to get stuck in a trough. <laughs> so I stop it, I give up, I'm like, I gotta put this thing away, you know? I gotta let you lay for a while, away from me, you can become your own thing again, me become my own thing again. To the point where I think, well, I've passed that time, uh, maybe occasionally on Friday night I'll have some uh, puff with a friends or whatever, but generally I'm trying to walk the good life line. I am seeing results yielded constantly in ways which I 
quite deep with that. There is an angelic quality to being sober. I think it is such a deep and worthy invitation, you know. Not a contraption, not a conscription, but a, a kind of like a drug of its own if you've ever not been sober. At all, you know what I mean? If you've ever had coffee or aspirin or, you know, weed or booze. But the point is, we learn something from that experience that makes having no chemical alterations a, a different experience in a good way. And then occasionally I find I need to get high again. Sometimes it's when I'm at my worst, you know, when I'm really, really down. I need that reminder about the wires and tape. It's probably stressing me out, so I could let that go a little because there's just wires and tape everywhere, you know. There's wires and tape inside of my red blood cells holding it together, <laughs> you know, and shooting electricity. All within this steel is a structure that's trying to keep itself together with some tissue that's sticky but also bendable and pliant. Mm, it's kind of all over the place, and it's a bit hodgepodge, and we kind of respond to things as they go, and food comes in, and air, and seems like you got maybe a little bit of a cold right about now, and this uh, arthritis is kicking in in the neck a little bit. All sorts of things going on, and all of it is run by electricity. There is a negative charge that sends something over an axon hump in the neuron, is what I read, that I thought was a pretty cool way of conceptualizing it, because it sort of feels like, yeah, I think that is what's going on, and then if enough dendrites send enough of their stuff across this chasm, by which I mean space inside of the neural links, and some receptors on the other side will send a negative charge over the axon hub, and that thing really starts to roll, and it's going over humps, and it's firing dendrites, and boom, 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 and suddenly there's images and memories, and I've decided I want to move the art on my wall, and I'm going to clean, and by God, I remember what it is that I love so much about being alive as a human being, which is two things simultaneously, one absolute utter presence and appreciation simply for the wonders of it all, at the exact parallel same time is a will and the ability to alter that environment. Simply as sweeping the floor, as grandly as building the architecture of an entire new ideology. As specific as the hats we wear. As emotional as being colored by whatever we feel. We have incredible capacities as creators of our environment. So being able to be both an active, active participant in our environment and appreciating it is a very delicate balance. Because appreciation lends itself towards a type of serenity. <sighs> There's a certain fate to it all. Oh, whether it's a divine plan or just a bunch of stuff, I can appreciate not only my size in the in-between as a tiny thing compared to the big things and as a giant compared to the little things, that there is some mechanism and spirit functioning well beyond not simply my grasp, but my stature. That in the same way I don't know how to program the cells in my lungs, I am some sort of cell in a much, much larger body that has its own intentions. That while I surrender to them, like a child on one of those carnival water slides where you're in the log, replicating the journey on the river, falling over a waterfall and getting sprayed. Ah. If that isn't one of life's truly great pleasures, I don't know. Why? Because who has not stood in a creek and longed to lift your feet and just go? Who's not fallen out of a raft or dumped out of an inner tube and gotten a little more caught in the current than you anticipated? <laughs> Gotta make sure I don't hit those rocks. I can't really steer clear of the... Oh, the rocks! Bam, bam, bam. <gasps> Whoa, that was exhilarating. A little terrifying, mildly dangerous, and also liberating. Go with the flow. Maybe I'll take on this set of rapids as long as I keep my feet up. Uh, who among us hasn't thought that and then thought, I wonder how big a waterfall I could tumble over. And then some people went ahead and invented like, little pieces of plastic, like fucking giant toothpicks that they insert themselves in and throw themselves off of massive waterfalls. Whoa. <laughs> whoa. I'm sure it's, whoa, amazing. And then we can shoot videos of that and get just even a fraction of the sense of what it might be through their stories images. So it feels good sometimes. To go with the flow. To let those accents fire over the hump and sometimes getting high when I've been down in the dumps helps. Whereas other times, getting high becomes this incredibly weird speed bump. 
sort of like a circular speed bump, whatever direction I take, contours. So I don't really realize it's happened to me. I think it's just my life, but somehow it just, I'm a little more sluggish. <laughs> the neurons aren't really sending charges over the hump. Can't really put it all together. <laughs> and the answer is not getting more high. That just makes it deeper and worse. So today was one of those days I've had a, I've had a rough patch. I think it's fair to say. I don't tend to think of it that way, whether that's good or bad. But there's a couple deaths that really rocked me. And there's a lot more deaths going on that really rocks me. And a lot of the time I'm able to take that and kind of transmute it into a deeper appreciation of my own presence as one is both want to do and hopefully taught to do by your experience. A great gift of death is depth in our own life. The greatest way we can honor those we've lost is to love being alive just a little bit more. And I rarely, in those moments where I love being alive a little more for those who stepped into the breach for me. For those who gave their life so that I can have mine. I find it real hard to not be appreciative of the tape and wires and nuts and bolts and all the people uh, in the world. <laughs> you know, so yeah, I have a real hard time not wanting to love everybody because everybody's just a part of everything and I, I mean, maybe I just want to love everything in those moments. And the whole reason I want to talk to you today was because I think that these devices, these tapes and wires, these nuts and bolts have a capacity for us to do that for each other. But there's some dangers we haven't maybe addressed yet in ourselves. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. And the danger is, uh, why am I talking? Who am I talking to? And what I mean by the danger of that is, we should always ask ourselves that of any video we see. Why did I choose to talk to you? What is my motivation? And who am I talking to right now? And we need to be honest about that. I'm talking to myself. I am talking to myself. There's no one here. This device is capturing and recording me talking to myself in an empty room, empty of other people. And you are not listening to me. You may well be alone in your own room. Or you might be in a more crowded place with earphones on. But I am not there. I'm here. So you are listening to someone talk to themselves. Which I think deepens the question of why is this person talking at all? Why am I compelled to talk to myself and record it? I think it's important and good to ask that of every video person you see. And don't listen to their answer. Don't listen to what I have to say about it. Monitor how you feel about it. Because why I'm talking to myself and recording it will be evident in the feeling it gives you. If someone is talking to themselves and recording it, whether in their home or whether in a studio that beams it out to 20 million people, same thing. If you feel angry after it, that's why they're doing it. If you feel confused, that's why they're doing it. So you might want to ask yourself, why would someone want to anger and confuse me? Whatever your answer, you probably can figure out it's not with the best of intentions that someone wants to anger and confuse you. And again, if you feel anger and confused, that's what they're doing to you. They're alone in a room talking to themselves. They are not representative of the current reality of your moment. Which is not to say don't watch videos of people talking to themselves. They're a wonderful part of the tape and wires and nuts and bolts of our moment that we can have the most profound gratitude for. Just ask yourself how I feel when I watch this. And can I separate out my feelings watching this now from the feelings I had five minutes ago? Do I just generally feel this way? So now, everything I see, I'm either feeling a little more or less of that feeling. Am I ever really getting to neutral? Am I really paying attention to what is impacting me and why it's out there? So, along those lines, 
uh, why am I here talking to myself? I think the best words that might describe it are relentless hope and desperate obsession. That's what it feels like, drives me. So then why am I sharing me talking to myself with relentless hope and desperate obsession in a way that would transmit to you? I think <laughs> Jesus. Uh, it sounds crazy and it may be that I'm wrong I don't trust myself that much <laughs> I'm a wily one in the mind I fool myself sometimes <laughs> uh, I think I want you to know that I love you I know that sounds a little, I mean, nice, you know. Maybe a little obvious if it's on that sort of superficial level. Or a little weird, like, well, you don't know me, you're not here, we've never met. Or maybe we've met, but this is an odd venue to talk about that. I, I think what I, I mean is that uh, I, I've at times experienced a kind of sense that everyone really is the same at this particular place inside of their human experience. There is something in common, universal about it all. And I think I've experienced moments when I can sense what it's like to feel everyone lit up. Sometimes it's just a single person in front of me that lights up. Sometimes we watch a room or a stadium and people light up. Sometimes we're caught up in the lighting up so we're not really aware of <laughs> you know, everyone's light. That's cool too. What it's like to not so much think about your own light, whether it's <laughs> projecting or whether you're getting enough of it from the world, and just see it all connected. It's a hell of a light show, you know. It's the cosmos, it's the stars. Imagine what humanity looks like from something small enough that each of our hearts is a star or each of our guts, or each of our souls, whatever the thing is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the center point is. But I feel it, and I see it in other people, and I know it can light up. <laughs> so if you imagine them all lighting up, whew, it must be amazing. And I bet it probably looks uh, beautiful. So when I say that I, I want you to know that I love you, that's how I mean it. Like, Hey, fellow, you know, participant in the cosmos that's quite possibly a light source in an undefinably grand and beautiful light show. But fun being here with you. <laughs> glad to be part of this epic light show <laughs> and the ones I get to see. And so I'm glad that you're here because it would not be the same without you. The very contour of everything that is changes when your light goes out. So thank you for having it on. I mean, that's either a weed advertisement or a real knock on weed. <laughs> that's either like, wow, or like, whoa, you need to take a break. <laughs>